hi, I'm Marty Jane Morgan. I come from Des Moines, Iowa. I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we had to move to Des Moines after that nasty war where the Yankees came and just burnt everything down and we had nothing left. So we moved to, Ch to Des Moines and I was eight years old when we moved to Des Moines. And I, when I was a 10, my mama enrolled me in Miss Lily's finishing school. And I, I Miss Lily's finishing school, oh, it was just wonderful. Miss Lily taught us how to crochet and tap and sing and read lovely books and sing and play the piano, dance, and how to flirt with our fans. Anyhow, when I was about 16, my daddy decided that he wanted me to come into the banking business with him. And see, I had three brothers. My two older brothers died of diphtheria, and my younger brother died of cholera. And so, I was the only heir to the bank, which scared me quite a bit. But Daddy assured me that he would help me, and I went into the banking business with my Daddy. And I learned cipher, and I learned how to do the books, and how to make change and deal with the customers. And I liked it, but Mama was not so happy with it. Mama didn't think a lady should be employed by a bank. So she decided that I needed to be introduced to some gentlemen and perhaps be married. So she and the lady across the street, Morgan, Morgan's mother, got together and presented me to Morgan. Now Morgan and I had known each other, but we hadn't discussed marriage or anything. We practically grew up together. But we got married, and uh, it was in the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church in Des Moines, Iowa, the ladies of the church, they decorated it so pretty with white flowers and white candles. Oh, it was just lovely, ladies. It was lovely. And then after the wedding, we went and lived with Morgan's family for six months, which was a custom. That way we would get to know his family and the ways of their family. And then six months later, Morgan and I moved in with Mom and Daddy, and we learned the ways of my family. And during that time, they talked about what Morgan would do, what we wanted to do with our lives. And we decided that, they decided, that me and folk decided that that's what we should do is to make the land run. And uh, the merchant, uh, mercantile would be a, something that people would need. And during that time, when we were making the plans, I got a letter from my cousin Billy. Now, I love my cousin Billy. We were so close when we were young but she's made the land run of 1891, and she was already here. I have a letter from Millie. Let, I'll read you my letter from Millie. Get my spectacles on. I keep my letter with me at all times. She says, Dearest Maudie, now Millie always called me just Maudie because her daddy and my daddy were brothers and their mama was named Maud. And she didn't know my grandmother, my mother's mother, Jane, who I was named after, Maudie Jane. So she only called me Maudie. She said, I'm gloriously happy to hear that you and Morgan are going to make the run to the Cherokee Strip. 
The mornings and sunsets here in the territory are glorious. The colors are beautiful. The wind is a bit much, but you get used to it. We settled in a lovely little valley with a spring-fed stream. Oh, Marty, the water is freezing cold. We built a soddy dugout in a hill not far from the spring. When Mom and, oh, Marvin is Millie's husband. Millie's, oh, he's sweeter, nicer man you have never met. When she and Marvin made the run in April of 92 to the Unaside Lands, they settled about five miles north of a town called, I think it's Watonga. We are so happy to have found this place, so perfect for us. We staked it and we got it registered. We, it will be ours in five years. Marvin has built a fence and a shelter for Jake and Brownie. That's their horses. He's building me a chicken coop right now. Some of the neighbors have gathered and they're helping us plow the land for planting. The most frightening thing happened. Some awful men came along and challenged our stake. They wanted the creek for their livestock. They were yelling and firing off pistols. Bless Marvin's heart. He remained calm and he said the land was already registered and if they tried to take it, he would get the sheriff. They left, they left and tried to bully someone else. Now, sweet Marvin, the reason I'm writing is because I received your letter about you and Morgan and the Cherokee Strip Run. I am so concerned about your delicate disposition. <laughs> you see, Millie and I were not raised the same. Millie's daddy was um, a livery stable worker and they traveled around quite a bit. She didn't have the opportunity to go to Miss Philly's finishing school. She says, a run is not for a lady like you. You know I love you and am excited. And you know I love new and exciting things. And I was not disappointed. We planned for months preparing for the book board and gathering food that we might need. We took beans, flour, sugar, coffee, and canned fruit and water. Marvin worked on the buckboard, greasing the hot wheels, making sure the spokes were tight and not cracked. He reworked the yoke and harnesses to be sure the horses were comfortable. We went on a prairie practice with, with the wagon and horses. We repacked the buckboard because things shifted around. We used lots of broken leather straps. The day finally came and we were lined up waiting for the strike of noon and the cannon boom. Oh, mighty the people. There were men with only a stake to mark their sides. There were bicycles, mules, bush carts, and some people on back foot, back horseback. There was a buckboard with a whole family, including babies. I even saw a lady riding astride a horse. Marvin and I got in line with the rest. We said a prayer and waited. Our future was on the line. The cannon sounded. It startled everyone, including the horses. The horses were so startled with the cannon boom and the commotion around us, they didn't know what to do. The dust was ever-present and the wind choked us all. The government lit fires in the deep grass and gullies, trying to burn out the sunas that tried to sneak in before the actual day. The smoke, the dust, the people screaming, men firing guns. It was like the gates of hell had opened up. Old Jake reared up 
causing Brownie to get off balance and we nearly toppled. Their eyes were so clouded with dust, smoke, and sulfur from the guns when the excuse me. When their hoofs hit the ground, they took off like the devil himself was chasing after them. I flew back on the seat and landed on Aunt Florence's trunk. Thank goodness I piled several quilts on top of it. I bounced off the chest, flipped on my back, and grabbed the back seat behind Marvin and held on for dear life. Oh my goodness. I wish I'd have seen that. Now, my Millie cousin is a portly woman and, and thinking about her flying back over the seat and landing with her feet up in the air and her petticoats and her pantaloons, her bonnet up oh askew. I just think that would have been just the funniest thing. Oh, <clears throat> back to the brownie. The dust, oh the dust. It was everywhere. Marvin put a kerchief around his neck, from around his neck over his nose and mouth. But his eyes were caked with dust. The poor horses were snorting and blinking, almost blind, but they kept running, trusting Marvin would guide them. Now, Monty, the reason I'm writing this letter is I want so much for you to be here, but I want to put so much emphasis on the difficulties of the run. I fear for your nervous system. You cannot withstand this stress. I pray Uncle Archie and Morgan's father, Ralph, can find another way. Please give this letter to them. I so dearly want you close. The train ride from Watonga and to Enon is not long. We can spend much more time together. We simply must find another way. Affectionately, your sweet cousin, Mary. Well, after I got this and I gave it to Mama, Mama was extremely upset. She, well, I could hear her yelling at Papa from the drawing room. And so <clears throat> Morgan and Ralph and Daddy got together. And since Morgan had six brothers, Morgan's daddy, Ralph, decided to make the run with Morgan. And we would drive the train to Kansas City. And I would get stay in a boarding house there in Kansas City. And Morgan and his daddy would get a buckboard and supplies and they would go and make the run. They made the run and got a city lot and a township lot where we could buy, where we could build a house later on. Several people hadn't made, gotten land, and they were looking to make money to get back to their home places. So Morgan and his daddy Ralph hired them to build a mercantile, and they built a two-story mercantile in 14 days. The bottom floor was to be the mercantile and the top floor was where we were to live. They drove back when it was finished. They got on the, they drove the horses back to Kansas City. Ralph got on the train going back to Des Moines and Morgan brought me home, home in Eatman. And we drove up to the front and Morgan, we went in and Morgan let me come in and there was a big pot-bellied stove right in the middle of the store. On the right side, Morgan had his mercantile and he had all of the stuff, the cotton uh, fabric for the ladies and he had beans and flour and corn to grind and coffee. And looking on the left side, Morgan had made me my 
Melody's Emporium, where I had the finest things. I had ribbons from France. I had, I had lovely perfume atomizers. I had the finest things, ribbons, hats. I had silks and tea from China. I was so happy, and then we went upstairs. There was our home where we would live. In the back of the mercantile, we had a big empty space all the way across the back. And it, it came to be a meeting place where the men folk would come in and they would sit around the pot belly stove. And us women folk, we would be in the back at a quilt and be, or we would crochet or knit and for the children of the orphanages. And, and on Sundays, we would have church services right there in our store. It was wonderful. We had people, the, the Methodist circuit rider would come by once a month and he would preach. We had visitors from the Women's Temperance, Women's Christian Temperance Society. They, would, they came and talked to us and we had Women's Suffrage came. Um, we had meetings for Philomathic and PEO. Those were women's groups that came. PEO uh, and uh, Philomathic are the Women's Federation groups. And the Philomathic was the love of books. And we got together and started trying to make money for the Lou Library here in Enid. I was so excited. Being here in Enid was just the most wonderful thing. And, well, I, I really must go. I have several things that I need to do. I have to restock my shelves. We just got a shipment in from Chicago through the train to St. Louis and then Des Moines and then to us. So I really have to go. It's been so fun talking to you all. Please come in and visit us at the Mercantile.